This program is brought to you by the combined resources of the Wisconsin Historical Society and Wisconsin Public Television. On Wisconsin Hometown Stories, a county founded in the heart of the state, built up by rail power and the bounty of the land, a county transformed by civil war, strong political winds, and powerful glacial waters that left a patchwork landscape woven into the fabric of history. On Wisconsin Hometown Stories, Juneau County. Funding provided in part by Philip J. and Elizabeth B. Hendrickson. Phyllis I. Moore, in memory of the Henry and Laura Griefy family and John F. Moore. The Carrie L. Schmidt family and Bank of Mauston, in memory of Thomas E. Schmidt. The Jean A. Trader and Joan M. Randolph families, in memory of Beatrice P. Bergdorf. The John and Catherine Orton family, in memory of the Honorable Thomas J. and Colette S. Curran. Mildred Frymiller, Friends of Wisconsin Public Television and the Wisconsin History Fund, supported in part by the National Endowment for the Humanities. When glaciers moved into Wisconsin during the last ice age, ice blocked the flow of the Wisconsin River, forming what is known as Glacial Lake Wisconsin. For thousands of years, most of Juneau County lay deep underwater. As the climate warmed, the wall of ice gave way, and the lake drained in a catastrophic rush of water. The surging cascade carved out the formations of the Wisconsin Dells in a matter of days. The uh, cliff that we see ahead and to the left marks the beginning of Juneau County. And it was just a cataclysmic flow. It just drained the lake in a matter of a few days. And so it was that outflow that carved through these rocks, shaping and forming and sculpturing the rock formations that we see today. Jutting up from the lake bottom, rock formations once islands in the glacial lake, carved by the waves and currents of a thousand feet of water. As the glaciers retreated, the land opened up once again to Native Americans, who left a legacy of effigy mounds around the county. In the 1830s and 40s, the federal government took possession of Menominee lands in Juneau County, and the U.S. Army removed the Ho-Chunk from their Wisconsin lands. We're forcibly removed five different times. Reservations were established for our people in Iowa. There were two reservations in Minnesota, reservation established out in South Dakota. And then finally, our people moved down the river to part of the Omaha Indian Reservation. But with each removal, there was a group of our Ho-Chunk people that would always come back to Wisconsin, always come back to our homeland. We believe that the Creator placed us here. This is the area that He intended for us to inhabit. And so they came back to the homelands to be where the Creator intended for us to be. This was home. Yellow Thunder was one of our great leaders. Yellow Thunder encouraged non-Native people to pressure Congress to include the Winnebago people or Ho-Chunk people in the Homestead Act. So 1874, they were included in the Homestead Act and many of our tribal people took 40 acre properties in areas where some of our old villages used to be. So that's why today we have large communities here in Baraboo, Wisconsin Dells, 
La Crosse, Toma, Mauston, Reedsburg, Wittenberg, Black River Falls, of course, is our larger community. But those were some of the old homestead sites. European homesteaders began settling the area in the 1840s, which until 1858 was part of a larger Adams County. It offered government land, low-priced land. It was the place to come. A lot of free land was being sold there. A lot of immigrants were moving in. There was a lot of land speculation going on in Juneau County at the time. We're beginning to just see that flux of Irish and Germans coming into Wisconsin. And that's what's interesting because you had this social world uh, underway. My great-grandfather, uh, Thomas, came over from Ireland, got a job in the Erie Canal, and uh, when his job finished up, he was uh, in the Chicago area and came north uh, to uh, Wisconsin. And he got up in this area and he said, this looks just like home, like Ireland. And uh, he got a warrant for the government to have 60 acres of land and he started farming. The town of Nasida formed around a mill pond and a sawmill, with the Yellow River supplying both the water power for the mill and the white pine logs. It was a mini pinery. The yellow had enough pine upstream to really foster a pioneer lumbering industry. In the South, wheat became the crop of choice for pioneer farmers. And harnessing the power of falling water on the Baraboo, Yellow, and Lemonware rivers, towns began to grow up around grist mills that ground wheat and other grains. This is a picture of Ben Borman. He purchased the rights to the power on the dam on the Lemonware River from the founder of Mauston, Milton Moss. Ben Borman had a huge flour mill, sold flour all over the Midwest. He had a lumber mill and a wool carding mill. Ben Borman built this 13-room home in 1876. It is now owned by the Juneau County Historical Society. It's our museum and archives. In 1858, the arrival of the La Crosse and Milwaukee Railroad fueled the growing settlement of Juneau County. One of the first railroads to cross Wisconsin came west from Milwaukee to Portage, crossed the Wisconsin River at, at what was then known as Kilburn, Wisconsin Dells, and that stimulated the population all the way up and down its length. Tracks were laid from Linden Station to Mauston, and then on to New Lisbon and Camp Douglas. Soon, a railroad called the Baraboo Airline ran tracks from Baraboo to Waniwak, and then on to Elroy. The day it got to Elroy, there was a stampede of animals and, because they weren't used to uh, that type of noise. Next, the Western Wisconsin decided to run tracks from Camp Douglas south, tunneling through the hills to Hustler and then on to Elroy, where eventually two roundhouses and other operations provided many railroad jobs. The railroads opened up the world to the rural county, and settlers began to pour in. Towns like Union Center built up around the railroad depot, and the rhythm of the trains became the heartbeat of the area. For farmers, the rails opened up new markets in Milwaukee and Chicago. Staples like wheat, flour, and potatoes were shipped alongside fruit and other specialty crops from Juneau County's varied terrain. But when you come to this county, there's a little bit of everything. I mean, when we look at Juneau County, uh, it represents a lot of things that you can find in the state. When we get to the southwestern corner of the county, it's the unglaciated area much like you see the western edge of Wisconsin. Lots of hills, beautiful valleys. And then when we get to the southern area where we are right now, we're standing in what would have probably been the, the tail end of the Glacial Lake, Wisconsin. We've got more of the prairies. Maybe not as heavy a prairie as you might see in Dane County, but still beautiful prairies. 
If you go farther north into Juneau County, then you get into what was once known as the Great Swamp. We get into some, in some beautiful uh, sand country that you would see in central Wisconsin, and, and also the wetlands that you might see in central Wisconsin, so it's very diverse. Juneau County's expanse of wetlands provided the resources for a number of specialty crops, like wiregrass. It was a particular variety of grass that is round and fairly seamless, and extensive acreage up there in northern Juneau County, and it was harvested and baled up. And Oshkosh was the center of the industry in Wisconsin, and mats and rugs and wrappings and other things were made out of this, and that industry lasted until the 1950s when they switched to plastic. And then another one is cranberries. The cranberry industry grew out of the fact that wild cranberries grow in wetlands and did grow in those wetlands up there. In the 1860s, an insect called the hop louse wiped out hop production in New York State. The price of hops skyrocketed, opening up a new opportunity for another specialty crop. It was discovered that the land in Juneau and Sauk and some of the Adams County was just perfect for growing hops. It went from five cents a pound to 50 cents a pound. So you can imagine the craze that it created for people putting in hops or people growing hops. Hops is a perennial vine. So it'll grow up a stake that you put in about 25 feet tall. It produces a walnut size uh, fruit and that's what's harvested and then that is dried down and that produces the flavor in, in beer. So the hops harvest was very labor intensive. So to harvest that crop, they would bring in as many workers as they could via rail. Isaac Allsbasher dealt in the hops in Mauston. He bought the hops from the smaller farmers and he also had a hop yard. Mr. Allsbasher hired uh, ladies and children from the cities that would come on the trains to pick the hops. He would have a wagon or two that he would uh, pick these workers up at the tracks and they would be singing all the way through town. Mr. Allsbasher built a very, very large mansion and he would have rooms for the workers to stay in. The early settlers here were subsistence farmers. First of all, they were just making enough money to, to feed the family, or they were raising enough food to feed the family. When the hops craze came in, that changed. So barns were built, houses were put up, pianos were bought. Well, when I got up to that 50 cent market, guess what? New York figured out how to get rid of the hops louse. So now we have doubled the production and the price dropped well below five cents, down to three cents a pound. And the people that probably borrowed the farm, went to the banker and, and bought a fancy piano because they were gonna make money at 50 cents, went bankrupt. Now, of course, if you put up a barn, that didn't go away. I mean, that added to the long-term infrastructure of this area. So some of that uh, investment in, in, in infrastructure stayed. As fortunes in hops rose and fell, Juneau County would soon be touched by a bitter conflict brewing a thousand miles away. With the attack on Fort Sumter, South Carolina, the frontier settlers of Juneau County were drawn into the impending Civil War. President Lincoln issued a call to each state to raise companies of volunteers. Rufus Dawes and his father, Henry, heeded the call, inspired by the patriotism of his great-grandfather, William Dawes. Along with Paul Revere, Dawes rode at midnight warning colonists of the outbreak of the Revolutionary War. So they were well aware of the forming of this country, and they felt they were saving their grandfather's work or their great-grandfather's work. Rufus was very active in, in recruiting for the company, and uh, they met three or four times, and they quickly got the 100 volunteers they needed, and then they have to elect these officers within the group, and Rufus Dawes was elected. And they came to the decision they would call themselves the Minutemen. And again, that's a connection to Rufus Dawes and his dad, uh, that they would call themselves the Minutemen like the Patriots of old. 
So they had this big meeting and that was pretty much the name they were going to use. And they said, well, are we going to be the Juneau County Minutemen? And one guy said, no, let's be the Lemonware Minutemen to remind us of the valley that we all came from. It's very local. You went to war with your cousins and your schoolmates and your brothers and fathers sometimes and sons. You got Irish immigrants, uh, James Patrick Sullivan from Company K of the Lemon Weir Minutemen. He's actually 17 years old and lies about his age to get in. Some Norwegians, some Germans, uh, a lot of uh, Yankees. And then they went to Madison where they are formed into the 6th Wisconsin. The guys went in homemade shirts and, and straw hats and they had their stuff wrapped up in a kerchief on, on a stick. They said they, they were pretty, pretty rustic boys. The Six Wisconsin became known as the Calico Boys because of all the, the homemade shirts, the colorful homemade shirts that the mothers send them, and sisters send them with. So you, you had a frontier company in many ways. Very proud of what they were doing. Very proud of Wisconsin. Wisconsin's a state 12 years when the war started. Did it earn its star on a flag? Well, they're gonna, they're gonna show everybody that they were you know, worthy of being part of the Union. And the 6th Wisconsin is shipped to Washington and ultimately becomes part of the Iron Brigade, which is the 2nd, 6th, 7th Wisconsin, 19th Indiana, and later the 24th Michigan. All Western boys. So you had a Western Brigade and those Eastern armies. They wore these big black hats. Look like pilgrim hats, but they were actually a military hat. They liked the big hats because it made them look big. And it also made them recognize as Western men, and they were going to prove something. And they did. They fight four battles in the space of three weeks. They fight Gainesville, Second Bull Run, South Mountain, and Antietam. And Antietam, a very, very hard fight in a place called the Cornfield where they just got shot to pieces. The 6th Wisconsin lost almost 50% in the, in the space of an hour and a half. But they make their reputation at Gettysburg. Rufus Dawes ends up being lieutenant colonel, which is the second slot on the, on the brigade. But his commander had been kicked by a horse, so at Gettysburg, Dawes is in command. He writes his best girl, uh, Mary Beeman Gates, the night before the battle. He said, I hope to do something brave. The Iron Brigade is thrown in uh, north of town because the Confederates are coming down that road. And so at a, for a period from 10 o'clock in the morning till 4 o'clock in the afternoon, the Iron Brigade and some other units, but the Iron Brigade primarily blocks the road so the Confederates can't come through. Outnumbered two and three to one, if you can imagine those kind of odds. And they're driven back literally step by step. And finally they're blown away and they have to run through the town. But what happens is they save the high ground that's so critical in Gettysburg. The Confederates can't get through the town fast, they can't capture the town, and uh, below the town are these ridges that the Union Army fortifies, and those ridges become the key to the victory at Gettysburg. So in many ways, they win the Battle of Gettysburg or are a key factor in it. But does anybody know that? No. They went into the battle with 1,883 soldiers. The brigade did, five regiments. 1,883 men. That night, when they took the roll, there were 491 left. And then they go on. They're regrouped and they fight at the wilderness and they go on through the rest of the war. And the 6th and the 7th end up at that strange place called Appomattox Courthouse. And then they come home. In the end, after all the war was over and they began to count up, the Iron Brigade had the highest percentage of loss of any brigade in the Union Army. It's a war record that's, you know, we should be proud of them because they stepped up, frontier boys, and opened the attack at Antietam, opened the fighting at Gettysburg, the infantry fighting, you know. It's just a remarkable record. They went to the war, one guy said, because I wanted to do something for my new country, an Irish immigrant. Another soldier said he wanted to be considered brave and he wanted to see the sunny south. But they stepped up and fought a very, very bloody war for four years. Some of them never got home for the whole four years until the day they got off the train in Madison and made their way to Castle or 
Lancaster or Boston or all those places they call home. And yet they blend right back in. Rufus Dawes wrote a letter to his old Lemon Were Minutemen reunion. He said the younger generation could hardly know that their modest neighbors fought on more battlefields than the old guard of Napoleon. And are now the, the nation's best citizens. When Glacial Lake, Wisconsin drained during the last ice age, it left a landscape that would defeat many of the best efforts to tame it. When the Glacial Lake drained, it evolved into the largest stretch of wetland in the state, the Great Swamp of Central Wisconsin, as it was called. Other parts of it, the parts that were slightly higher and drier, developed into pine barrens, as we call it, oak savanna areas that resemble, really many ways, a park. Groves of trees, and in between was native grasses and sedges in the wetlands. It was a natural landscape and, and a managed landscape in that Native Americans also burned it on a regular basis, and that maintained those grasslands. None of this land is really good for agriculture, and that, of course, has affected, affected the history here. Marsh farming in general was a particular feature of Juneau County. The state kept agricultural statistics, and you'd go down the list of corn, oats, and da -da -da -da. There, would be, there would be hay, and there are always two categories for hay. There was tame hay, and there was wild hay. Wild hay was marsh hay. It was a crop that was free for the labor. You did not have to sow it, it came back. Occasionally they would attempt to improve it by burning it. They'd come out horseback, uh, with cartons of the old farmer's matches. And uh, they'd spread out, oh, a half mile apart and ride back north, sent, setting fires all the way. And all the marshes, and that was burnt off. That's why the marshes were so clean and abundant with hay. One farmer told me it was the best hay you could possibly feed to horses. And the other one said, well, we worked the horses so hard, they were so hungry, they ate anything. It's even Marche. By the end of the 1800s, the American frontier was coming to an end, and settlers had to look for opportunities on less fertile lands. There is a surplus of people in rural areas who were looking for land. And in addition, there are also was a great wave of European immigrants, Poles and Bohemians, uh, Czechs, still plenty of Germans. The majority of these people found jobs in, in, in American industry and, and built Chicago and Milwaukee and those, and those big, big cities. But there were many of them who also were interested in land. You have this submarginal land, of which there is a lot in central Wisconsin. And of course, northern Juneau was, was part of that. Joe Babcock, who was a congressman from Juneau County, he had made his fortune with the Nasita Lumber Company and owned a lot of land, and he and others, he was, wasn't certainly alone in this, they discovered the new technology of the day, which was the steam drag line, the steam excavator. This device was really the death star for wetlands, certainly in Wisconsin, but really all over the United States. This machine was powerful enough to dig ditches and drain the great swamp of central Wisconsin. My folks came from Iowa back at the turn of the other century. They really pioneered that country. They came just as the ditches, the drainage ditches, were, some of them were being completed and others to do. Developers organized several drainage districts, which would tax farmers to pay for digging miles of ditches. Despite the extra tax, the offer of cheap land attracted many farmers from Illinois and Iowa. Land had got so high-priced down in them states 
that they couldn't afford to start farming. And this land was advertised by land companies and it enticed young couples to come up and buy some of that cheaper land. Now this is a picture of my folks and the Williamses, which were other settlers. And uh, that's a picture of uh, my dad and uh, me as a baby and my sisters. This was the first place that my folks built when they came to Wisconsin. This was the second one that they built and started. When you drain these marshes, they, they, well, they look really good. There's a couple of feet in places, and sometimes more than a couple of feet, of, of black peat. Looks like fertile soil. But of course, it's not. It supported a crop, a good crop for maybe a couple of years, and then its fertility was worn out. Then it was just dry stuff. Well, when they drained all this water off, what Leopold called the drainage dream became the drainage nightmare because now you got this dry stuff on the top and it was very common for the early settlers in the spring of the year to light the grass afire. Well, can you imagine lighting the grass afire when there's this dry kindling, this peat moss, and that gets a hold? That would smolder all summer long and may not even go out until midwinter when the snow actually puts it out and you get enough snow out there. So all of that peat burnt off and all that was left was this sand that really wasn't productive at all. There's the great quote from Aldo Leopold that the drainage dream sucked dry the marshes of central Wisconsin to create farms and created ash heaps instead. The farmers that agreed to buy the land and be taxed like everybody else normally, but then also to tax themselves in addition to this ditch, many of them could not survive the tax consequences of this, so they walked away from it. So there was lots of land there that was left vacant, was gone back to back taxes. By the 1930s, half the land is in delinquent taxes. The drainage districts went broke. During the Great Depression, years of record-breaking drought made a bad problem even worse. Eventually, the federal government stepped in with a New Deal program called the Resettlement Administration. The RA began buying up land in a wide area of Juneau County as part of a larger program throughout the Great Marshland area, conserving wetlands for game birds and animals. They would actually find another farm for someone, and say, well, we'll buy your farm, and this farm is practically worthless. And then we'll also get you help you in this other place. In 1934, the agency bought out the farm of the Walter Brundage family, who lost several crops to frost in the low-lying area. It purchased a new farm in southern Juneau County and resettled the family there. While many were more than happy to get out, about a third had managed to succeed and saw no reason to leave their homes. My folks were very reluctant of selling out. They, they liked it here. They did very well. Dad had, had a, quite a name for Jersey cattle and it got down to where they were the last ones there. Eventually, all the farm families sold out, and the Civilian Conservation Corps, or CCC, set up camps in Nesita and Finley and began work building dams on drainage ditches. As the water backed up, it reflooded the wetlands, and the ecosystem began to come back to life. With the stroke of a pen, President Franklin Roosevelt created the Nacido Wildlife Refuge in 1939, setting aside over 46,000 acres of land. The state of Wisconsin leased a similar acreage for the Meadow Valley Wildlife Area, and from that point on, a large portion of Juneau County would be preserved for conservation and recreation. As the wetlands returned, the number of waterfowl rose dramatically. And over time, the Nacido Wildlife Refuge would play a key role in helping to save several rare and endangered species.
just north of Waniwak, a stone memorial marks the birthplace of Belle Case La Follette. She was born there in 1859, lived there till she was going on three years old, and then the family moved to the Baraboosa County area. At 16, Belle Case entered the University of Wisconsin, where she met her future husband, Bob La Follette, who would come to be known as Fighting Bob, the insurgent progressive governor and Wisconsin senator. Belle La Follette became the first woman to graduate from the UW Law School and served as Fighting Bob's chief advisor while raising four children. She was the mother of a governor of Wisconsin, their son, Philip, and their son, Robert La Follette Jr., was a senator. During the Great Depression, Governor Philip La Follette opened an office of rural electrification and appointed Orland Loomis, an attorney from Boston, to help farmers in northern and western Wisconsin get electricity. It turned out he was the right man in the right job. Loomis, nicknamed Spike, grew up in a politically active family. He recalled hearing loud arguments between his grandfather, a conservative county sheriff, and his grandmother, a staunch backer of the progressive reforms of fighting Bob La Follette. Loomis sided with his grandmother, and after law school and service in World War I, he began to build a political career. Elected to the state assembly as a progressive Republican and two years later to the state Senate, Loomis believed that expanding the use of electricity was key to Wisconsin's progress. He also believed, as many other progressives did at the time, that local government should own the power plant in town. And therefore, you, ex you extend service to everyone. That's that democratic ideal. One of the results of his work is that to this day in Wisconsin, we have a number of municipally owned electrical power utilities. They tend to be in smaller cities, but there's about 80 of them altogether. And they really owe their existence in many ways to the legal work that Loomis did in the legislature. When Governor La Follette tapped Loomis to organize electric co-ops in Wisconsin, there was a huge gap in the standard of living between people in the city and those living on a farm. And one of the chief dividers in terms of living standards was, of course, whether you had electricity or not. Electricity on the farm means that you have a well, which means you don't have to pump water to, to water your cattle. You can then take care of your animals better, and you maybe can add more of them. You also can invest in a number of labor-saving devices that were available yet in those days. Electric-powered milkers were available then, if you had electricity to use them. Loomis organized cooperatives around the state that could take advantage of federal loans to sink the poles, string the wires, and install the transformers needed to electrify the countryside. In essence, the cooperatives did the work that the power companies didn't want to do. All they had to do was then just plug in their power plants to this distribution system and, of course, collect the money. So in many ways, the development of this rural electrification was positive for just about everybody involved. As a result of Spike's work here, by 1940, thousands of farmers who did not have electricity now had it. Still politically ambitious, Loomis joined the recently formed Wisconsin Progressive Party and won election as attorney general. He always seems to be a politician who acts on principle. He seems to be that kind of man, that he worked for what he believed in. 1940, La Follette chooses not to run for governor, and Spike is his logical heir. And in 1942, of course, that's when Spike wins. This does not mean, however, that I intend to sever my relationships with my home or with my friends in this vicinity. I shall always consider Boston as my home. Well, I'm afraid the ending, of course, is not, is not happy, as we know that uh, in between the election and the inauguration, uh, Loomis dies. And his story then becomes one of the great 
what ifs of Wisconsin history. Here's a man you could say, he did something good for the people of Wisconsin. At the time Spike dies, there is a young man growing up in Elroy, Wisconsin, and he becomes the other governor from Juneau County, Tommy Thompson. This is downtown uh, Main Street of Elroy. You know, some people always uh, downplay where they come from. I'm proud of the education, the start, and the beauty of this land. Isn't it gorgeous up here? This is all our farm on both sides, clear over up on the hills over there. My mother was raised uh, in the house right next here. My father and, and her met in a two-room school where my mother taught uh, the first four grades and my father taught the upper classes. The school board said that they could not have two teachers uh, dating in the same school, so uh, he left and built a gasoline station downtown and uh, he married my mother and uh, then they started a family grocery store. My mother was Irish and her beliefs were it's easier to smile than it is to frown. She was a very outgoing person. My father was a big German uh, guy who uh, believed that uh, if you wanted something, you go to work. I told you my father was German. He made me at the age of 13 paint that barn down there. So I had a German culture and an Irish culture come together and made me, I think, a much better person. My father built this house himself, and that's where I was born, in that house right there. Looks pretty nice now, but... So I walked to school from that house up to up to uh, the two-room school on the edge of town. You grow up here with a tradition of hard work, and uh, you you have to be a doer. Uh, you know, it's it's tough growing up in a poor and in a small town, but uh, if you got the courage and and the basic intellect to to make things happen, you know that's that's what you learn in a small town. You learn that you can do. You learn that you have to do it. Play all the sports you wanted to. It didn't have to be that good, and you could still play football and basketball and baseball and run track. As a young man, that's uh, pretty heady. This small, this small building was the Thompson Grocery Store. We had the regular and Ethel uh, gasoline. We had two pumps and a place uh, for cars to drive in. Over there on the side, uh, to get their grease and oil changed, and so. We, uh, we pumped gas, changed oil and grease, and sold groceries. On Friday nights, my father was the vice chairman of the county, and all the farmers would come in from around the area, to, and my father was chairman of the Road and Bridge Committee. And so they'd come in and talk local politics and talk about fixing roads and repairing bridges and so on and so forth every Friday night at the Thompson Grocery Store. And from that became my love affair for politics. And I worked my way through law school as I worked my way through undergraduate because we were very poor. And uh, when I graduated, I was working in the Capitol and watched and decided I could do this job as well as anybody. Everybody told me I couldn't run for the assembly and I, my father says, well, if you believe in yourself, go do it. My father gave me 10 bucks a day and put five bucks of gas in the car and spent five bucks going around the three counties, Adams, Juneau, and Marquette County, and, and I was every place. And I'm a workaholic, I guess I got that from my father, and I just believe you worked hard and accomplished what you set out to do, and do a good job once you get there. Beat Louis Rommel, who had been in the state assembly for 16 years in a Republican primary, and then went on to win the general election at the age of 23. This used to be in my law office. Nice to see you out and about for a change. How are you doing, my friend? Very good. Everything going well? What are you guys doing? Everything's going finer than frogs here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm showing them where I used to practice law. There you go. I had been in the state assembly 20 years. But you have frozen us out of the budgetary process. I'd run down and to yes, the Capitol, and I was the minority and leader. I'd get there and work Tuesday and Tuesday nights and all day Wednesday and Thursday mornings, and then come back Thursday afternoon and be in court all day Friday. And then on Saturday afternoon, I had a small farm then, and we raised beef cattle. And my wife said, 
you can't keep doing this. You got to you got to do something else. And so I said, why don't I run for governor? And so my wife was supportive, never thinking I had a chance to win. Can I say hello to you, sir? You got it made. You got a television and everything in your cab. I'm Tommy this was Thompson, strictly shoe leather and driving from one event to another and uh, and showing up and giving a speech. I said, I'm from Elroy, Wisconsin, and if you don't know where it is, it's right between Union Center and Kendall, north of Waniwak and south of Hustler, and always got a laugh. Surprisingly, we had seven people in the primary, and I got 51%, which was uh, an amazing thing because nobody thought I was going to win the primary. And then it was just Tony Earl and myself, and Tony Earl and the Democrats didn't think I had a chance. So they sort of just ignored me to their peril. People thought the state was not going the right direction. So people took a chance, and I won uh, by over 100,000 votes on uh, election night, which was uh, shocking to everybody. And so when I came back, I rode into Elroy with my wife, and it was cold, but the feeling of goodwill and, and so on, you know. We went down Main Street, and it was just packed. We went to the school. And I gave a speech. It was a very touching day. I still remember I said, if you uh, come into Elroy, and if you don't have a uh, tear in your eye and a lump in your throat, you're not human. And that's, that's how I felt. We're Cutler Cranberry Company, and we have about 700 acres of cranberries in the ground. Cranberries have four hollow chambers inside them. If you break one open, you can see the four air pockets inside, and that's what enables us to harvest them this way, that they can float in the water. We use this floating corral boom to corral the berries down to one corner of the bed, and then we have a spray bar that goes out into the water and sprays the berries and the water and any leaves or other trash up into a tube that then separates the berries from the water and the trash. And then we can put the berries into our trucks and the trash into our trash truck and the water goes back into the bed where it came from. A place for everything. <laughs> My great, great, great grandfather uh, was one of the pioneers of cranberry growing here in Wisconsin. This photo here shows four generations of the potters. This on the far left here is Guy Potter, my great-great-grandfather who bought this marsh in 1923. His son, Roland. His son, Bruce, who's my grandfather. And this is my dad, Martin, and one of his brothers, Joe. It's one of only three fruits native to North America, the cranberry, the blueberry, and the Concord grape. A common misconception is that cranberries grow in water. They actually don't grow in water. Um, they grow in very sandy soils, but you can see here it's a perennial vine growth. Um, so once these plants are planted, they can last pretty much indefinitely. We have beds that are over 80 years old. They would grow naturally and people would just hand pick them out in the, the swampy, marshy areas. And from there, people began to dig ditches around there so they could better control the water movement in and out of the beds. And that's kind of how cranberry growing got started here in Wisconsin. Looking back historically, Native Americans used the cranberries when they found them growing wild for lots of different things other than food. They used them for medicine. They used the cranberry juice for dye. I was born at Black River Falls. And I move around with my folks here and there, wherever they could make their living. Take blueberries and strawberries. And then in the fall, we come to cranberry marshes. That's where I got started raking cranberries by hand. It's pretty hard on the back, you know. You stoop down to reach the base. At first, we used to rake 10 hours a day. Then after a while, they cut down to eight hours. Even that is too long, too hard. You work like a horse, a mule. <laughs> but then we had to do it to earn our living. This 
self-propelled mechanical harvester has long metal fingers that pull the floating berries off the plant. Probably the biggest change was going from hand harvesting to mechanical harvesting of cranberries, which was in the early 1950s. It enabled growers to pick a lot more cranberries and they could therefore expand their marshes and have more acres of cranberries. Around that same time, cranberry juice cocktail came around and so that greatly expanded the consumer demand for cranberries. Before then, it was mainly fresh cranberries or cranberry sauce were the two big products. Um, so I think it was kind of a combination of those things that really helped the cranberry industry explode. It takes a berry with a bounce to get by this machine. Bad berries won't bounce, so they fall straight down and are culled out. Cranberry growers are very innovative. Um, you can't go to the implement dealer and buy a, a cranberry harvester. So uh, everybody kind of builds their machines a little bit differently. We share ideas freely and kind of build what fits our beds best. This machine, it's a, a standard tractor that we built harrows on the front and back. And basically the tines are bent at an angle. And when they go down into the water, they shake. And that's what knocks the berries loose off the vine. This new machine is more gentle on the plants. Sharp eyes and skilled hands pick out any poorly colored berries that are left. Everything used to be hand sorted and uh, packed by hand. They did have bagger machines, but everything else was done by hand. And now we've really come so far in being able to do a lot of things electronically and have machines to help us get the job done more quickly and more efficiently. Wisconsin currently grows over half the nation's cranberries. We've been the number one cranberry producing state for 18 years now. This is the 18th year, so we're quite proud of that. Over half the cranberries that are eaten around the world come from Wisconsin. When Glacial Lake, Wisconsin drained during the last ice age, it left Juneau County with a patchwork of soil types and rock formations, with wetlands and sandy soils covering much of the county. Parts of it have been called the, the soil is the most unfit for agriculture in the state of Wisconsin. Ironically, the less fertile land became a major attraction for the county. The town of Camp Douglas got its name and its start as a logging camp, supplying fuel for wood-burning railroads. Just north of Camp Douglas, the Wisconsin militia purchased a large piece of land for another kind of camp, a training ground that would become known as Camp Williams. And Camp Williams was used for annual training encampments, usually a week or two weeks long. Every unit in the state would go there either all at the same time or staggered throughout the year. It's a centralized location in the state, and then it's also on a main rail line that goes through Wisconsin, so it's much easier for units from all parts of the state to get to that location. It was inexpensive land. Uh, it was land that was safe to conduct rifle training with the large bluffs there, and they would conduct rifle practice, uh, basic tactics, just general military living and all the customs and courtesies and protocol and discipline with that. And as the National Guard evolved, the facility evolved to meet the needs of the National Guard. After World War II, the Wisconsin National Guard outgrew Camp Williams and moved most, but not all, of its operations down the road to Fort McCoy. At the same time, the newly formed Wisconsin Air National Guard moved in to Camp Williams, building runways and other infrastructure for aviation training. And since then, the facilities have served the missions of both Guard units. And in the late 1950s, the Air Guard portion was renamed Volk Field in honor of Lieutenant Jerome Volk, who was a Wisconsin Air National Guardsman who was shot down during the Korean War. When Glacial Lake Wisconsin drained and carved out the formations of the Wisconsin Dells, 
it created a natural amphitheater at Stand Rock, where members of the Ho-Chunk Nation performed ceremonial dances. 1917, 1919, somewhere in that area, is when they had the first dances take place. At that time, it only ran for about two weeks. It was in 1929 that they started having the summer long shows where it would start usually about the second week of June and run through Labor Day. And so it was a nightly performance, seven days a week, and it ran consecutively until 1999. Um, so it had a long history. In its heyday, in the 50s and the 60s, uh, the place was packed. Uh, even up through the, the late 70s, early 90s, uh, when I was operating it, uh, the amphitheater was able to seat over 2,000 people. And most nights we had a, a sold out crowd. So it was one of the major attractions. In 1950, completion of two hydroelectric dams on the Wisconsin River flooded thousands of acres of the old glacial lake bed, creating the Petenwell and Castle Rock flowages. The Wisconsin River Power Company completed the projects that began with buying up land in the 1930s. It's really not hard to buy it. Here was many people were happy that somebody was, somebody, anybody was willing to take this, this dirt poor land off their hands. My daughter and I, we made this map and then we came up with the overlay to show the people where their property was. And as you can see, there's lots of uh, property owners. I had an obsession with taking pictures out there, but every week I'd go out there and the water was coming in more and more. This is what is now flooded. This is all water. And it goes down through here and up in it, in case the Yellow River. This became the Buckhorn State Park. This is my mother, and this is my aunt from Chicago, and this is my aunt from Wisconsin Dells. And they called up and wanted to see the place for the last time. And they couldn't believe it, because they were born there. Mm -hmm. And we were lucky to get in and out that day. <laughs> but the next week we went out there, and we really almost, I don't know how we got out of there. They were built solely to hold water, to, to act as reservoirs for the power plants. As time went by, though, it became obvious that, oh my gosh, there is how many miles of water frontage that could be developed here. Much of the frontage remains undeveloped, and what has been developed hasn't been developed until maybe the last 20 years or so. But it's been, of course, a tremendous economic boom to, to Juneau County. In the restored wetlands of the Nasita Wildlife Refuge, a project to reintroduce the whooping crane brought international attention to Juneau County. And that's a species that almost became extinct in the whole world. It was down to very few birds left. Here was a bird that had to be trained a migration route to leave Wisconsin during the cold winter. And so they were trained to follow the ultralight uh, wherever it went. And so they followed it clear down to Florida. And so it captured uh, both national and international attention. We had filming crews from uh, all over, from Korea, uh, Japan, uh, Canada, and they were coming to do uh, their documentary of this project. Uh, and the Cedar Refuge became what we call in the Fish and Wildlife Service a flagship refuge, a refuge that uh, stands out that people come from other states just to see something in that refuge. It got us congressional support and also public support for a visitor center. And so that was kind of a, a spin-off of this project. And once that was created and built, you have interactive displays, uh, video media to watch. Then you have some adjoining uh, nature trails with interpretive signs. At this point, uh, people come here all day long and, and the refuge can expend enough hours that then they need a restaurant and a motel. So at that point, there's so many things in Juneau County that they can go out and, and look for different attractions. So ecotourism has expanded tremendously in this area. Juneau County's diverse landscape and its history mirror in many ways those of the state of Wisconsin. It has a logging history just like Wisconsin. It has the agricultural history that Wisconsin has in that southern and western part of the county. 
It has those great marshes, just as the wetlands, of course, covered a third of Wisconsin. It certainly has the railroad history that Wisconsin has. It had the dependence on resources to make a living that the rest of Wisconsin has. And so it can be said that if you know the history of Juneau County, in many ways you know the history of the state of Wisconsin. Funding provided in part by Philip J. and Elizabeth B. Hendrickson. Phyllis I. Moore, in memory of the Henry and Laura Griefy family and John F. Moore. The Carrie L. Schmidt family and Bank of Mauston, in memory of Thomas E. Schmidt. The Jean A. Trader and Joan M. Randolph families, in memory of Beatrice P. Bergdorf. The John and Catherine Orton family, in memory of the Honorable Thomas J. and Colette S. Curran. Mildred Frymiller, Friends of Wisconsin Public Television, and the Wisconsin History Fund, supported in part by the National Endowment for the Humanities. <laughs>